Well, I think the, the major message should be prevention because uh, obviously we can prevent it in more than 99% of cases by using rhesus amulabum effectively. So I would want to be sure that they have some system in their office for checking that initial screen to make sure it's negative, that they have a system in their office to be sure they administer the standard 28-week dose, they don't miss that, and that they check another titer at that point and that they have a system to follow up on that uh, screen at 28 weeks. If they do that, their hospital is going to pretty much take care of them after the baby's born uh, with quality assurance, but it would be to be sure they follow the standard protocol for prevention. The other part would be that if they do detect an antibody, then pick up the phone and call a perinatologist because this is such a rare disease that they're not going to be that familiar with all these new free DNA techniques and other things. They should be consulting. They shouldn't be trying to manage that on their own because this, there aren't just that many people out there with the knowledge about it. I'll sit down with them and do a complete consult. We'll go through the history, uh, and then we'll, um, we'll go through the pathophysiology, because most patients just don't understand all this. So we'll explain what's happened. Tremendous guilt. I found that the mother feels that she did something wrong. Her body's attacking her baby. We'll ally her guilt. Uh, this is a natural process that happens with exposure to a foreign antigen. And then we'll lay a whole plan out for that uh, generalist. And in her case, it might be just to simply follow titers once a month and call me back when the titer hits, say, 32. And then we'll come back and start doing some ultrasounds that will look at the MCA Doppler. But I would let him continue to follow her as long as he, you know, is pretty methodical about getting the titers that I recommend. And I may or may not see her back, I'll tell her. If the titers stay low, then I might say that's all we have to do. We might have a talk about paternity and zygosity testing. Uh, we might talk about free DNA if she wants to know that. If dad's heterozygous, we could check free DNA. And if the baby's negative, we'd be done with her. Say, so go have a normal pregnancy. But uh, clearly, I would have her come see me, go through all of these issues, lay out a plan, and then say she would or would not have to come see me later, depending on whether the disease gets worse. So now she's at risk for fetal disease. If we haven't done free DNA testing, we would offer that as part of the evaluation. We would say, okay, let's figure out what your baby really is. The likelihood if her titer went from 1 to 4 to 1 to 32 is that she does have a positive baby. It's really, But I've seen negative babies in that situation. So why does titer change? Different technicians doing it different places. It can change. Uh, and so I would say you're likely to have a positive baby, but let's do the free DNA test, make sure dealing with a, a baby that's affected. If the baby's affected, we'd start MCA Doppers. We'd probably do them once a week for a couple weeks to see the trend. They're looking really good, as I suspect they would in this case. We'd stretch them out every two weeks, and then we'd keep doing them every two weeks the rest of the pregnancy. Try to get her out to 38 weeks if we could.
reducible and there's a change in the trend. Well, I think parvo is an interesting disease in that um, most of us feel that we should follow the MCAs for a period of time after documented maternal infection. And some people say 10 weeks, some people say six. And if the MCA goes to the anemic range, we shouldn't wait till the baby becomes hydropic to go in and get blood and document the anemia and then give blood. Uh, I wouldn't wait till the baby's hydropic to do that. Uh, I think the babies with hydrops just don't do as well with the transfusion itself. Um, my dilemma I sometimes see is a baby who mom doesn't have a great history of parvo but comes in with non-immune hydrops with a high MCA. Mm -hmm. So you're suspecting parvo but you don't have it documented. I think you're sort of in a quandary. Do you move forward or do you document the parvo first? My bias has been that if she has small children, maybe a iffy exposure, um, had a mild fever rash earlier in the pregnancy, I'll go ahead and do the transfusion and get fluid and blood on the way in and document the parvo. But I've been burned once where I had a CMB like that. So the baby was severely anemic, uh, had non-immune hydrops, we did the transfusion, but the CMB came back positive and we stopped. Um, but but parvo is a little tricky because it's, uh, you know, it's so prevalent in the community, especially in the school age kids, and then the teachers start coming in with it and you don't know what to do. Uh, but. Uh, I like to document what I'm transfusing. I don't like to just go in and do transfusions for babies that we don't know what the clue. And the CMB case sort of taught me that. Well, we always uh, repeat it to be sure that it's true. And if we believe it now, we're going to uh, have a long talk with the mom and, and take her to the OR the next day to do a transfusion. Uh, we'll have uh, blood ready knowing that we might go in and find uh, a false positive result, a normal crit. We use 30 as our cutoff. But if we get in there and the crit's 30 or below, and we have a coulter in the room, we're lucky enough to have the blood bank support us with a coulter counter. So they come down with a portable coulter. They've done the quality control on it, run the standards. We'll hand the blood off, and we'll know within three minutes what the real crit is. We don't spin a crit. We don't use HemoQ. We actually get a coulter. First, I'll know the MCA's, MCV's high, so I know it's fetal. And secondly, I'll know the exact crit. So we'll uh, give the baby, after we get in the cord, we'll get a sample, give it to the culture folks. We'll go ahead and put a paralytic agent in. We'll use, use Vecuronium. We'll start infusing the blood, but at a very slow rate, just enough to keep the needle open. Wait for the amatocrit, and then decide how much blood to give. Uh, but we'll do all that in the OR with blood ready in a sterile situation. Uh, after 24, 26, we've talked to neonatologists. They want to be there. They have a skeleton crew in the oral with us if we ever have to do an emergency C-section. Um, that comes up so infrequently, but uh, it's nice to have them there if something goes wrong. Well, it depends a little bit on gestational age. So let's say she's 22 weeks. I'm going to be a little less aggressive with fixing the anemia than, say, if she's 27 weeks. So I find in the 20, 22-week range that if they're severely anemic and we fix their hematocrit, in other words, we take it up to 45, we can actually cause cardiac failure and the baby can die. So let's say we got into a 22-week fetus and the hematocrit was 10. It's really bad. Normal would be 40. We'd probably take that, that kiddo up to about 22, maybe 25 at the highest and stop. And then we'd cease and desist, wait 48 hours, come back again, Typically, the hematocrit will have dropped down a little bit, but then we'll take it up to 45 and complete that. Uh, we have a tendency to put blood in the peritoneal cavity, too. We do a combined procedure. I probably wouldn't do that till the second transfusion. I wouldn't do it at the first one. Um, as far as how much blood to give, I mean, it's based on the coulter, and we use weight, and one of our fellows came up with this really cool formula that I still use. No computers. He takes the weight in grams, multiplies by 0.02, and that's the cc's of blood to raise the crit by 10 points and works every time it's too simple i mean i use computer programs and one day he came in and said you know i realized that if we just simply multiply the grams by this factor it always comes out to be the blood we use and so we retrospectively looked at it and he was right on right on point so uh, we always try to get our units in the high 70s we don't get into the 80s we'll get like 79 78 is easier to push through the needle. And if you get that crit at 79 to 78, because that's part of the formula, and you know you're starting to matter crit, and you know your weight, 
and you take that weight multiplied by 0 0.02, that's the cc's of blood, donor blood I have to give to raise it 10 points. And it is so on target every time. And everybody goes, that's just too scary. So I make the fellow on the drapes write out what he's going to give, how much drug he's going to give based on weight, how much blood he's going to give based on the weight. And we have a little thing written right down the drapes, how much blood we're going to give without doing any calculations on the computer. And it works. So that's where the controversy comes in about using MCAs again. And again, I'm not in the MCA camp. There is a randomized trial going on in Australia where they're using empiric intervals versus the MCA. And until the trial comes out, we won't know. But I think that we might, you might cut one transfusion off at the end using MCAs, but you're not going to cut off too many. So our empiric time has been to do the next one at 7 to 10 days. It just always seems to be the right time to do it. The next one two weeks out and then every three weeks. And that's, I've never been sorry using that protocol. So I just use an empiric time interval. And yes, sometimes we go in and the crit's looking pretty good. It's high 20s, low 30s, and we go, oh, well, the baby's not too sick. But then we take it back up to 45 and then get out. So, um, you know, hematocrit of 32 is not physiologic. And remember, we're putting adult hemoglobin in there. It has different oxygen carrying capacity than fetal hemoglobin, which should have been in there. So I feel like we should keep the numbers closer to normal. Um, so we'll target a 40-45 as our number. But we use that one week, two week, three week interval and it seems to work. Yeah, so I would look at her titer and even though we talk about titer not being predictive, obviously if she has a titer of 128, she's got the disease, but if she has a titer of 4,000, she's got really bad disease because what may have happened at delivery, uh, depending on how much we transfuse this baby, is more cells may have gained access to her system and she had an amnistic response or titer went higher. So I look at the titer to start with. She's titer 128, maybe we left her at 64 last pregnancy. I'd start MCAs around 16 to 18 weeks when I can get into the baby because I really can't transfuse the baby before 16 weeks. Yeah, I think you can try intraperitoneal you know, early, but truly intravascular is 18 weeks at, at the earliest and the best of hands. And even that, it's difficult. Loss rates are over 50%. Uh, but you could try an intraperitoneal you know, early along in that case if you had to get a high, if you had a high MCA, say 16 weeks. Now let's take a different scenario and she's got a titer 4,000. I probably would be talking to her about this uh, sort of uh, compassionate protocol we use with plasmapheresis and IVIG. 12 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks, we would plasmapheresis her three times, uh, give her IVIG. At the end of that, two grams per kilo over two days, and then a gram per kilo every week and then follow like a hawk with MCAs. And we've done that with these high titer women and had good success. But they all end up needing transfusions at say 24 weeks, which is technically doable. You can get them in 24 weeks, you're gonna have an outcome. The ones that come in 2022 that are so hard, particularly depending on the habitus of the patient, the center localization. But, um, so I do use titer in the next pregnancy to kind of decide how sick that pregnancy might be and it does affect my management. And obviously I'm assuming we either have a homozygous dad, or if we don't, we have a heterozygous dad that we knew about, 10, 12 weeks we'll do free DNA. And we'll check to see if we might be lucky and have a negative baby on board, and who cares what the titer is. And we've had that happen. Come back with a 4,000 titer in the next pregnancy, heterozygous dad, 12 weeks free DNA is RH negative, go have a normal pregnancy.